it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Professor uh, Spencer Barrett, and he's not a candidate for our position in conservation <laughs> biology. Um, Spencer is a university professor at uh, the University of Toronto and Canada Research Chair in Environmental Genomics. He's had a long and illustrious career at U of T. Uh, the research in his lab uh, focuses on the evolution of plant mating systems. His lab also works on the genetics of invasive species and uh, the role of local adaptation and colonization. Uh, Spencer and his students have been prolific in all of these areas and have uh, published over 300 papers. And for his work, Spencer has received much national and international recognition. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of London and also of the Royal Society of Canada. <coughs> Uh, as well as a foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has won the Civil Rights uh, Award from the American Society of Naturalists, uh, the Merit Award from the Botanical Society of America, the Ensor Stacy Award, just to name a few. Uh, much of Spencer's work is, uh, has been a model, really, for me as to how to ask interesting questions in plant evolution that can be addressed uh, both in the field and in the laboratory. His, uh, success, he has been successful in applying this approach to a number of different systems, some of which he'll talk about. We won't have time to talk about all of them today. And uh, many of the studies that he has done in his lab have uh, produced textbook examples of things in evolutionary biology that uh, we have all read about, including the evolution of inbreeding and depression. Uh, the role of drift uh, in direct inter interfering with uh, selection, and most notably how systems of uh, outcrossing evolve and, and break down. Um, on a personal note, I first met um, Spencer, well, I won't say how many years ago, but at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, I was just arriving, and Spencer was finishing up and had been offered a job at the University of Toronto. Um, I was impressed then, as I've, I've always been, about um, Spencer's enthusiasm, the enthusiasm with which he approaches his work and uh, his science, his generosity in sharing his ideas with others, and he's been a great colleague over the years. So um, today, Spencer will talk to us about reproductive evolution at uh, range limits in science, and before Spencer starts, let me remind you that there's a wine and cheese afterward. Let me also point out that this is uh, being recorded for the VGSA and will be available on YouTube, on, the YouTube, on their YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dan. This is an absolute pleasure to come to McGill and give a talk to you. Um, there's an interesting sort of historical circularity for me in that it was 34 years ago. Um, just after Rowan was born, that I gave my last seminar at McGill. So um, I came here in 1981 for a seminar. I don't think you were on the faculty then. Um, and here I am, still kicking. <laughs> so, so it's been a long time, so I'm really looking forward to telling you a little bit about the work we do. And I'm going to, sort of a bit unconventional, I don't normally start with a, a promo for work in the lab, um, but I'm just going to tell you about a little, little bit about some of the other projects because this, this particular talk on range limits is not something I particularly was withdrawn to because of a theoretical interest. And the talk I'm going to give really cobbles together three particular studies, all of which involve range limits under kind of one overall theme. Uh, it's, as I say, it's not something I've ever written a grant about and it's really just come about through extensive sampling. Uh, that I think is required if one wants to characterize the reproductive systems of flowering plants. So let me just sort of say that um, most of the work in the lab right now is on the evolution of sex chromosomes. This is where my interests are, particularly in um, Y chromosome degeneration and its relationship to bias sex ratios in flowering plants. And I have two PhD students um, and a collaboration with Stephen Wright that is involved with this work. Um, I have another project, I've had a long-standing interest in the evolution of polymorphic sexual systems and we've been working on heterostyly and like many other labs we're trying to do two things and that's find the, find the elusive supergene, um, we're using genotype by sequencing to try and actually get at this supergene uh, in the genus Icornia 
And because, as you'll see from part of my talk, this particular group has multiple independent breakdowns to selfing, um, we're actually interested also in the genomic consequences of those transitions in mating systems. Um, I've been very fortunate to get a student, an MSc student from Concordia, David Timmerman, who some of you may know, he attended lectures here at McGill, who's basically a biomechanics guy. And he's very interested in uh, wind pollination, which is something I picked up on about a decade ago and realized it was a great gap in my understanding of reproductive transitions. As you probably know, wind pollination has evolved multiple independent times in the flowering plants from animal pollination. But there's not a single theoretical model or physical model that explains why wind pollination evolves. And so we're using wind tunnel analysis, uh, theoretical models and the genus Thelictrum, where there are multiple independent transitions from animal to wind, and try to characterize what actual features of the flower predispose some lineages to go to wind and others to remain at animal. Uh, Chris Below is a, is a student who is very interested in Baker's Law and colonization, and what we're interested in in this particular project is actually asking the question, um, how important is self-compatibility in actually getting colonies started during the invasion process? And so we're looking at the concept of leaky incompatibility, the idea that some self-incompatible plants have variants that are self-compatible, uh, and asking to what extent do they enable, essentially, migration forward in an invasion? And this is being done experimentally by setting up colonies with uh, these individuals. And then lastly, I have a postdoc, Stuart Campbell, who did his PhD at Cornell, who's absolutely at, right out of my field. I and mean, I was sort of one of the things I like to do, particularly as I'm getting a bit long in the tooth, and that is to sort of venture into areas that I don't really know anything about. Why not? It's good to learn new stuff. And I'd always wanted to learn more about plant herbivore interactions. Because I had this feeling generally that there was this sort of this idea that you could have these these two areas, plant herbivore interactions on the one hand and plant pollination biology on the other, a mutualistic interaction and an antagonistic interaction, and yet we don't have, those fields have never really been put together. And so what Stuart and I and Mark Johnson are doing is investigating the sort of co-evolution of mating and herbivory. And we're using Arabidopsis lyrata to do that and looking at what is happening in Lyrata, where there are multiple independent transitions to selfing in different parts of the eastern North American range, and looking at how that is affecting defense genes and molecular evolution. So that's kind of what we're doing, but I'm not going to be talking about that. Um, that just sort of gives you a sense of some of the projects in the lab. What I want to do is to just tie together three sort of studies that arose at different times through different reasons but are united by the fact that they're all concerned with processes that are operating at the edge of the range of the species. So I'm going to talk about Icornia, which has been a, a system I've worked on ever since I got my PhD thesis at Berkeley in the 70s. And the reason that species is particularly interesting is that there are multiple independent transitions to selfing that have very important biogeographical consequences. And I want to talk about um, Essentially, processes that are operating in island populations at the edge of the range. And they're going to move to a completely different system, and some of you botanists may know this plant. It's very common here in, Ontario, in, in Quebec and Ontario, and that's Sagittaria. This is an aquatic macrophyte where our studies at the range limits are showing some really interesting sexual system diversity, which is not present in other parts of the range. And so there I'm going to be talking about sex ratios, and this generation of sexual system diversity in geographically marginal populations. And then lastly, although this isn't to do with reproductive systems per se, I want to look at some work um, done by a PhD student, Rob Coletti, in my lab, and earlier work by Chris Eckert, looking at purple loosestrife, which is a wonderful system for invasion biologists because it's spreading rapidly, and we're being very interested in whether or not this species is evolving local adaptation to a shortened growing season as it's moving north uh, in eastern North America. Okay, so, you know, here's the conceptual bit, and it's a bit lame, and you all know it, but, you know, why would we want, want to study range limits? Well, things happen at range limits that are different, the demography changes, 
Uh, particularly in plants, there are lots of interesting changes to the reproductive biology of plants at range limits. Things like a paucity of pollinators, a greater emphasis on clonal propagation, and so on. Um, and we often are, those populations are often confronted with novel environmental conditions. We can get insights onto the genetic consequences of, the, of, of these colonization events and what happens to populations when you have a restriction on gene flow. And that's particularly the case for certain kinds of colonization events, particularly the ones that involve uh, continental island colonizations, for example. And what's nice about this field in general, although I won't be testing any of this specifically, is that there is a rich theoretical literature that goes back to Haldane and a lot of other people who wondered about what happens at range limits for, for species. Um, now, why it's particularly good for plants and why uh, it will be sensible if you're studying the reproductive biology of plants to look at range limits is that plants have tremendous intraspecific variation and, and that particularly relates to their reproductive systems. And so one of the sort of general rules of any student who's working with me on reproductive systems is, you know, I don't want you to just study populations in a local area go and do in your first year a good geographical sampling throughout the range because you'll almost certainly find novel variability, particularly at range limits. So I think plants are particularly good for that uh, because of their intraspecific variation. Now I'll get do the thanks right now. The work on Iconia is really a collaboration between Rob Ness, um, uh, who did a PhD in my lab, Stephen Wright, uh, who's my colleague at Toronto, and Ramesh Arankumar, who's a PhD student with me. The work on Lythrum, was started by Chris Eckert, is a PhD student in my lab, and then Rob Colletti and Jessica Montescu both did graduate degrees. And then the work on Sagittaria is two PhD students, Marcel Dorkin and Sarah Yekomowski. So let's start off with some natural history in the first little vignette. Okay, so Iconia paniculata, what is this species? It's an annual, it occurs in ephemeral pools in very, very unusual environments. And that is, there are essentially like Californians know vernal pools. Well, there are pools in the Caatinga region of northeastern Brazil, which has the highest coefficient of variation of rainfall of any environment in, in the New World tropics. So very, very unpredictable climate, and throughout these pools, these vernal pools, in an area about half the size of France, are populations of this annual showy flowered diploid icornia that is related to the famous water hyacinth, which clogs up canals and dra uh, drainage ditches throughout the world. This is an annual. Um, we've done a lot of work on this species, and I've had some wonderful students, Martin Morgan, Brian Husband, and others, who've worked on this system, and we know a lot about its population biology and its mating system evolution. It has extensive variation in mating system. In other words, there are populations that are completely selfing, or very highly selfing, through to those that are largely outcrossing. And outcrossing in this system is promoted by a genetic polymorphism known as tristyly, where there are three mating morphs within populations. But this system breaks down uh, quite often. And when it breaks down, it gives rise to these selfing populations. And what I want to talk about is what happens when these selfing populations um, go places. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the colonization of the geographical margins of the range. And I want to just show you this particular set of, um, well, this cartoon in a simulation, because it's important in understanding the actual mechanism that drives this system to selfing. And this is work done by Brian Husband many years ago. The idea is that with tristyly, you basically have a polymorphism that is maintained by negative frequency dependent selection, which drives the mating morphs to an equilibrium of one to one to one. In fact, Ronald Fisher worked on this problem and provided the first theoretical solution of the isoplectic equilibrium for a tristyly species. And he actually did empirical work on Lythrum. Uh, it's one of the only things that Fisher ever did in terms of like real empirical work. He went out and surveyed populations to see whether he could get one to one to one morph ratios. However, genetic drift will cause deviation away from that isoplectic equilibrium. And intuitively, you might think that since drift is a random process, that if we are going to lose morphs from populations through fluctuations in population size, drift, and bottlenecks, 
Why wouldn't we lose the morphs at equal probability? It turns out that's not what happens. In fact, there's a strong asymmetry in the likelihood of loss of the three morphs, as indicated by that stochastic simulation. The short style morph is lost most often, followed by the mid, followed by the long. You can think of that axis uh, in which all of those dimorphic populations are clustered on as almost a sticky surface, where if a population hits that side of the triangle, it's not going to bounce back into the middle. In other words, it cannot regain trimorphism. And this is simply because of the genetic architecture of tristyle. There is a constraint built into the inheritance which prevents populations, once they've lost the short, from ever becoming trimorphic again, and that's because of there's an epistatic interaction between the two diallelic loci that control the polymorphism. That, combined with the fact that the allele frequency at the short locus is substantially less than the other three alleles, means that the short morph is most often lost through genetic drift, giving you a dimorphic <coughs> population. And we have shown, I think, to my satisfaction at least, that this process of drift and founder effects in these very unstable populations gives you a fit, a, a sort of a stochastic signature that fits this model of loss of short through drift giving you dimorphic populations, which then run up that sort of side of the triangle because of selection. So it's the interaction of drift and selection that gets you to selfing. And so this is one of the very few examples where a sort of partial Wrightian perspective on the interaction between drift and selection is causing a peak shift from outcrossing to selfing. When Nick Barton, Mike Torelli, and colleagues wrote their famous evolution paper, this was just one of four examples that at least fitted the first and second phases of the shifting balance. Now, looking at the actual mechanisms by which we go to selfing, of course, we're talking about mating system modifier genes, and we know the genetic architecture of these changes. These are simply recessive alleles that are made homozygous through self-pollination, which then fix in populations because of reproductive assurance. We can cross selfing variants from different parts of the range. The selfing variants are on the right. They have a modified stigma. This is a single recessive allele that just causes that filament to elongate 24 hours before anthesis, causing autonomous self-pollination of the flower. We find there are different recessives in different parts of the range. So if we cross two selfing phenotypes, we go back to wild type as a test of complementarity, if you like, of the different alleles. And once we have a selfing phenotype, of course now, through Baker's law, there are these opportunities for selfing to allow the establishment of single individuals in populations following long distance dispersal. For those of you not familiar with Baker's law, it's simply the idea that a selfing individual has an advantage in establishing on islands or away from the main distribution of populations because the individual can make with itself. So this is our geographical distribution. We have in the northeastern Brazil, the vast majority of populations there are trimorphic with all three morphs. There are some dimorphic and monomorphic populations there. I mean, it's not completely trimorphic. In fact, there is the standing genetic variation in northeastern Brazil that allows these colonists, or has allowed over time, to go to other parts of the range. And so if we sample at the geographical northern end of the range on those uh, in Central America and, and the islands, we find selfing populations. And they can either be monomorphic or dimorphic. The vast majority are monomorphic, but there are a few dimorphic populations that contain selfing mids, and that's the mid style form with the selfing, ver uh, selfing phenotype, and an occasional long style form. And levels of diversity, as measured by the molecular markers, indicate huge differences in the amount of diversity in those central populations in northeastern Brazil compared with the island populations. And we've shown through, um, sort of, it's not a phylogenetic tree, it's a network analysis because we're dealing with nuclear genes here, uh, but essentially there is evidence for multiple independent transitions and probably one colonization event for the Caribbean and a separate colonization event, the, the red, um, Populations there are populations that are exclusively selfing. Okay? So multiple independent transitions. 
Now I want to move to sort of what the new stuff that we've been doing, and that is, this is sort of that was a kind of a primer on kind of the Iconia story. One of the big issues for us was, uh, is the occupation of these habitats, particularly in the Caribbean, such as Jamaica and Cuba, is this a recent colonization event? Uh, or has, does it have a long history? As you probably know, this genus Iconia has a lot of invasive species in it. And so we wondered, particularly since the species is very common in rice fields, whether this couldn't have been a human introduced introduction uh, as a contaminant of rice. Most rice weeds get around as contaminants in rice seed. Um, and so what we wanted to do was to see whether we could see whether it was sort of how long has it been there. And in fact, it looks like it's not a recent introduction. It has a long history in both Jamaica and Cuba based on some coalescence modeling that we've done on populations based on um, uh, genetic or molecular data. And it probably colonized the Caribbean way before agriculture was invented. I mean, agriculture's only been around for 14,000 years. And so rice cultivation has a relatively short history. So I think we can rule out here uh, a recent invasion. This looks like something that got there a long time ago, probably on the feet of waders through long distance dispersal. Now, what Ramesh has been doing more recently has been very interested in, well, what are the consequences of this kind of invasion of these islands to selection across the genome? And so what we've been doing here is we've been very interested in the idea that one expects a reduction in effective population size in selfing populations, and the product of the effective population size and the strength of selection is going to affect essentially selection of efficacy across the genome. This has been a bit of a slippery one to study and there's not that many good examples of where we can see whether empirical data actually match theory here. There have been quite a few people who've looked for is there any evidence of a reduction in the efficacy of selection in selfers? I mean we should see that. And we got a little bit of evidence of sort of small preliminary evidence. It wasn't a particularly strong paper because we had a limited sampling, but we did see some evidence based on codon bias. But what we wanted to do instead was to use polymorphism data to see if we could do that. And so what Ramesh has done is to do range-wide sampling throughout the range and use next generation sequencing to essentially look at the distribution of fitness effects of new mutations in selfing populations. Um, essentially using the allele frequency spectra approach and the methods of uh, um, Peter Keatley and Adam A. Walker. And what we are particularly interested in is sort of two things. One is, what is the strength of selection going on on mutations? And are we seeing a higher fraction of those mutations becoming neutral because of the effects of drift and, and linked selection? And we do get evidence for that. We find that there are more sites that are effectively neutral in selfers. And this is probably explained, and we can't distinguish their individual effects, by a combination of drift, bottlenecks, and linked selection. In other words, processes like background selection. So there is evidence, then, of a reduced efficacy of selection in those selfing populations. What we weren't expecting, but what we found, which is quite exciting, is at the same time, there's also evidence of strong purifying selection against deleterious genes. This can be viewed as sort of evidence of molecular purging in these selfing populations. And this is rather heartening to me because in the early 90s, Deborah Charlesworth and I published a paper in Nature with evidence of purging of the genetic load in this very species in these populations. But our, start, our analysis was based not on molecular data, but it was based on phenotypic traits, time to flowering, flower number, and so on, because that's basically the only approach we could use. So we'd already had some data indicating purging of phenotypic effects um, way back in the early 90s. So to sort of conclude this bit, uh, I think what we've shown here is that there are multiple independent transitions which sort of says something important, I think, for those who like to map traits onto phylogenies, and then, you know, you see these estimates of the number of times of a transition. Well, there could be lots of transitions going on within species. And so these really are lower bounds on those values. And that's because in plants, there is often enormous intraspecific variation. And these processes may be occurring over and over again within species. <coughs> 
Our earlier work, I think, has shown very nicely that the interaction between genetic drift, founder effects, and selection for reproductive assurance, the ability of individuals to set seed without a pollinator, is driving this transition. And clearly, once one spawns off these self invariants, it can change the whole biogeography of the species and allow populations to explore different parts of the geographical range. And then once we get into these fully selfing populations, there is evidence for the reduced efficacy of natural selection, but also some evidence for stronger purifying selection uh, against deleterious genes. Now I want to switch gears now and talk about plant sex and gender and I'll introduce to you a completely different system that involves a plant, as I said, that is pretty common here in eastern North America. Go to any freshwater lake, and there's a reasonably good chance that you're going to see arrowhead. And early work that was done in my lab by Marcel Dawkin in, in the sort of, sort of 10 years ago found a really interesting pattern. I mean, I should say I found the pattern initially in terms of discovering that there was, in fact, two sexual systems in this species. And Marcel then um, did a really nice piece of work. And let me explain what, what he did and what the story is. Because I'm going to make the story a lot more complicated by saying, well, you know, we didn't look at range limits. So this story isn't as clean as we thought it was. I mean, that's the message here. So what we found is that for most of the range in eastern North America that we investigated, any population could be put into one of, one of two categories. They either had combined sexes, they were hermaphrodites, and we call that monoecious because the plants have male and female flowers, that's the left-hand panel A. The male flower is at the top, the remaining flowers there are female. Okay? I know if there's any really hardcore botanists in the audience, you're probably cringing because botanists hate the term male and female flower. They like pistolate and staminate, or staminate and pistolate. But I refuse to use those terms. So I'm just going to call them male and female flowers. And if a flower has both sexes, I'm going to call it a hermaphrodite, rather than a perfect flower, which again is the terminology. And so we have two sexual systems. We have hermaphrodite populations, which are monoecious. And we have dionecious populations where there are separate sexes. And what Marcel did through a series of studies was to show that, first of all, they're fully intercompatible. You can cross them. So they're not separate biological species. Secondly, um, they occur in different aquatic environments. And this was done through common garden and reciprocal transplant experiments where we put the species and the populations of alternate sexual systems in each other's habitat and showed basically that monoecious populations are adapted to ephemeral aquatic environments, such as farm ponds, drainage ditches, and through sort of repeated annual surveys that they're turning over all the time. They actually have a sort of almost a metapopulation structure, whereas the dioecious populations occur in very large marshes, highly competitive environments, where they're usually coexisting with cattails. And they have quite different life histories. I mean, they're both perennials, but the monoecious populations are fast growing. They produce flower, they flower really quickly, usually in June and July. And uh, I don't know whether those of you, I mean, it's probably out of vogue now to talk about R and K selection, but you can think of them as being more R selective, whereas the, the uh, ones adapted to freshwater marsh, marshes tend to be bigger, delay flowering. Uh, and they, they are the dioecious populations. So that was the story. Well, okay, so I started looking more carefully after Marcel left at what was going on right at the range limit of the dioecious populations, particularly up along the Ottawa River and around um, Algonquin. And we did this, this is work by Sarah Yakimowski, another PhD student. We've recently now really carefully looked at the gender of all of these populations at the range limit. And it's a lot more complicated than that, than that simple story of two sexual systems. Um, what that is is a sample of 116 populations that are just ordered by sexual system. And the frequencies of the three sex phenotypes, there's only three sex phenotypes that you can get in flowering plants. They can either be male, female, or hermaphrodite. So we're just essentially saying, what are the frequencies of those three sex phenotypes in these populations? And I won't go into this in detail. This is recently published last year in Molecular Ecology. 
But what we've done is also to show that these RAMET shoot sex ratios match genet sex ratios. So this was a study of uh, the relationship between these two sort of units that we use <laughs> using microsatellite markers to estimate clone size and clone gender. So this is a reasonably faithful sort of sample of genetic sex ratios. And what you can see here is enormous variability. Uh, among the dioecious populations, you start off with a lot of variation in sex ratio, which is not surprising because there's quite a lot of clonality going on in these populations. Most of these populations in a non-equilibrium condition it takes a long time to get to the one-to-one -one sex ratio. And we've done some models on that and shown that depending on the level of sexual recruitment and so on, to get to one-to-one -to -one can take a considerable period of time with the inheritance pattern for sex that is in this species. It's a two-locus model. So there's a lot of variation that, that is just a function of who gets there first, and most of these populations are non-equilibrium. But then as you move across, you'll notice that you start to get hermaphrodites in those dioecious populations. And so what we would say here is we have a low sort of level of hermaphroditism. And the way botanists have tended to interpret this following David Lloyd is that what this represents is what is known as sex inconstancy in males. And now I'll just <laughs> give you a little sort of vignette on, on plant sex, what we find in dioecious plants very, very commonly, if we sample them, is a small amount of standing genetic variation for sex inconstancy. But what is particularly interesting about that is it's always the male sex. You hardly ever find female inconstancy. Females know what they are. They're female. Males tend to produce a few ovules on the side, particularly if they get a bit bigger. So there's size-dependent gender modification in males, and this is very, very common in plants. But usually, that is maintained at a low level in populations. Now we get to situations where we're not talking about a low level. These are these mixed populations. We're seeing a substantial number of populations that have got not equal frequencies of the three sex phenotypes, but different ratios. And so the question becomes, what is going on here? And why this is theoretically interesting 